is our 360 wave system. So if you've seen this last summer, we first introduced it. We're going into a beta year this coming spring. And uh, it's designed as to do two key things for you. One is starter placement through the hose here on the back, through the tube. And we're also using it to help us with closing. So if you think about how your true V is formed, most closing systems today work from the top and they work from the side. So we're coming along that open trench and we're trying to push it together from the top and from the side. In the case of the wave design, we're using this blade to come alongside and cut through the side wall. You can see here where our seat is. Here's where the blade ran, three quarters of an inch off to the side. That's ideal starter placement. We're close, but we're not on the seed. And we're positioned with starter to be able to grab that radical root as it comes out of the seed and our first crown roots to come into that hot zone and take off from that starter. You can see we're running here in Texas in a rock field that's got wheat stubble, some real severe conditions, and we're putting this thing to work. And what we're doing here is testing the two key joints in this design. So it's very simple. There's no actuation, no sensors, no electronics. It's all self-driven because of the angles that are in this blade. So as we're going ahead through the field, this blade's naturally trailing on this pivot point that you see right here. So we're looking that, for that to take care of any changes in the planter direction. So as this blade is close to the seed, we know we've got to be careful, right? We can't get into the seed itself. So we've designed it so that the sharpness here is angled on the bottom of the blade. The hard facing here on this side maintains that angled sharpness as well as the bend in the blade itself. So that as the row unit turns to the left, the stop that you see up in here will engage the blade and it'll go ahead and push that blade away like we would want it to. But if you think about if this was rigid and I turn to the right because the seed is here on this right side, if I would do that with a fixed blade, now what's gonna happen? I'm going to turn that into the seed. So what we've done is we've designed it so it naturally engages here at the tip in the ground so that as the planter turns, this joint opens up like you see here where I can put my hand in now behind this joint. That opens up and it moves that blade away from the seed path until the row unit straightens back out and then it'll come back in line. So that's the, the main key joint in this design is this trailing joint that allows us to always stay close but not contact the seed. From there, we have what we call our rock joint. So we're spring loaded. The blade will float there, as you might see, where our spring is engaging here in the, in the video. You can see that blade's gonna change just slightly. If we hit a rock, it's able to bounce up and over that. So we're able to get out of the way and snap back down into position. So it's, it's rugged built though in the sense of a, a solid casting here, a set of castings that are really tough able to hand up, handle those kind of uh, hits, but we wanted to be able to get out of the way and not do what? Not influence our row unit depth, not change our seed position because we're taking too much force. So in general, we're cutting just through that side wall and we're doing that because we know it's gonna help us with closing as well. So I mentioned the starter placements, close, it's near the seed, but what about closing? So as we talk, closing from the top and from the side can be a real challenge. If you guys dig or you use an air hose, you'll be able to come in and find most often that middle seam still where we've taken our two sidewalls and we pushed them together. Sometimes we don't get them all the way together and that causes an air pocket. That's gonna cause challenges with emergence. What we like about the wave design that I think is really cool is we're taking an advantage that we have of being able to cut through the sidewall. And as you see right here in front of you, we've given the closing system that would be coming next a real advantage. We've taken some loose soil there, and what is it? It's moist soil because we're cutting down partway down that sidewall. We're not taking it right off the top. In fact, we're shielding dust from coming in here on the top side. We don't want dry dirt with the seed, but we're working our way down that sidewall and we're peeling it over on top so that you can push dry or moist soil rather on top of that seed and shield it. Now when our closing system comes over, there's no middle seam anymore where we're gonna shove those two sidewalls together. Now we've taken a wave, that's the name of the product, is this idea of rolling this moist wave over the top of the seed. Now that closing system has an easier job. It's able to go ahead and firm that soil together because we've already done half of the work for it while we're putting our starter on. I think we're gonna find, and from what we see in our early data, this system's gonna make sense even if you're not running starter purely for what it does for closing. And when you think about how easy it is to fit into your row unit, it's gonna be one of the simplest choices you have out there. So we can mount it in two ways. One would be 
This casting here on the rear that your closing system mounts to, we replace that with this one that you see here. And we've added a mounting face to the front that gives us the ability to go ahead and tie in our wave. And so we don't lengthen your row unit, we don't change your closing system that you have, any closing wheels that you like, I think we're gonna make their job easier. And so you're gonna be able to continue to run those. If you run Bandit, which we think you should, and we hope you do, we have the mounting here in the front, we add a bracket with the same mounting pattern that you'll be able to run. So this coming spring, we're fitting the Max Emerge, the Exact Emerge, and the Kinseys that you see here on this planner. And we're gonna be able to focus on what can we do as far as both starter and closing. So right here in front of you, if you look carefully, you can see where I've taken an air hose and I've blown out this seed. And if you wanna come up as soon as we're done here, you can take a closer look. But what we're looking at here is exactly what I mean when I say the wave, that you'd be able to see uh, right in here where our blade was, we firm, and then we're gonna cut that wave over the top. And the seed there is firmed in like you'd wanna find. We've designed it so that that firming attachment can use some of the tails that are already in the market. So if you might have a smart version, you might have a no stick version, those are gonna fit into this design as well as we'll offer a firmer for you as well. So you're gonna have some choices there as far as tails that you might use that you can work with the blade. So you can see here what we're looking for, the sidewall on this side is still intact. This side's been blown apart. I also like what that does for us. If, if in our conditions, our downforce, a lot of guys are running hydraulics and that does an excellent job. But even in cases where that might still struggle a bit, we've blown open this sidewall over here and we've, we've loosened this up. You've seen attachments that do that in the past and you know there's some benefit there as well. So this sidewall is still intact. You can find the seed right here next to it. And then this soil that's all here along this wall, you can see it's tied in. If you come up and look at it afterwards, you'll be able to see this right in this area. I can move it out of here, but that's where we've taken it and folded it over. So 360 Wave is gonna be a simple attachment you can add this coming spring. Uh, we're excited to have those of you that are interested in doing testing work with us on it. We've done a lot of testing ourselves, like you see us running right there in Texas here this winter, uh, putting it through its paces. That was uh, certainly a challenging field from sticky soil to rock, uh, to dry conditions. We had the whole gamut while we're there putting full seasons of use on these systems. And in fact, we're running here today, planting in Texas right now. So thanks for your time. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you'd like for Wave. If not, go ahead and move on down to the sprayer. They're gonna talk to you a little bit more about how you manage your nitrogen program. So welcome. And thank you for coming to 360 Yield Center to our indoor field day. It's about the only place to have a field day in January. We've converted this horse arena and we're gonna have a good time running some equipment. It's kind of fun to run stuff indoors in January, kind of an odd, kind of an odd thing. So we're standing in front of a brand new Heggy. High drop or wide drop set up on it, undercover set up on it. We're gonna walk you through some of the features, some of the things that we saw this year coming out of a challenging growing season of 2019. So we know about nitrogen. We know the way it moves. It doesn't spread out. You can see here on this slide, we've got alternating green and yellow strips through our ryegrass. Wide drop system was run through here. You would think that nitrogen, when it hit the surface, spread out and fertilized all that grass. It didn't. Nitrogen dilutes and it moves down with water. It leaches away from us. It gets into our water source. We can see here, knowing how nitrogen moves, what we need to do with it to get it into our corn plants. The reason a Y drop works is not only it works with the fact that corn uses 75% of its nitrogen after V10, it also works by the fact that it places nitrogen in the root zone. 90 some percent of a corn plant's root mass is in a seven inch diameter by seven inch tall column. You can see it here in this cutaway. Where's most of the feeding happening? It's happening right around the base of that plant. The reason a Y drop works, the reason we can get away with putting nitrogen on the surface is stem water magnification. The way a corn plant is designed, those leaves funnel water to the base of the plant. We proved it here. You can see these PVC pipes taped and caulked around the base of a plant. We have an 8x magnification of rain at the base of the plant versus the middle of the row, 15 inches away. So if we can see where the moisture line is, where do you think we ought to put the fertilizer? Right next to the roots. 
Some of you who came to our Proving Grounds plot this summer took a look at this plot with me in my session. I went to school at the University of Illinois, got a degree in agronomy, and I learned that corn takes up 1.1 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. And that is true, that's what corn takes up. So that's what most people apply to every corn crop. So if I have a yield goal of 215 bushel, that's 250 pounds. I called my retailer, I said, weed and feed, check, my nitrogen's done for the year. I said, what if I've been following 360 a little bit, I wanna try and do a little bit better job. I'm going to intentionally band my base rate of nitrogen with the planter, then I'm gonna come back with Y drop and add what the corn plant's going to need based on the year. With that, I'm gonna cut my rate. I'm gonna save some money on fertilizer. With the broadcast, we hit it. My agronomist and my agronomy professor was right. 1.1 pounds per bushel, we made 218 bushel. I made three bushel above my yield goal. But what about over here? By split applying and banding it next to the root system with the planter and with the Y drop machine, I made 240. I had a 22 bushel gain and my nitrogen use efficiency was 0.9. It wasn't the 0.7 that we shoot for, but hey, that was 2019. Don't get me started on that. Mineralization was lowest it's ever been. Here, I had $100 in fertilizer cost. I saved some money on the application. It was easy. I called the co-op and they did it. Over here, I spent some money on application, but I saved it on fertilizer. Why did the situation on the right turn out so much better for me? I had the same $108 investment in both systems. I sold that corn out of the field this fall in central Illinois for 375. Basis was good around here this fall. And my gain on every acre of corn by changing my nitrogen system was $82. If I'm a 1,000 acre corn farmer, that's an $80,000 bill in my checkbook at the end of the year. Just by, with the same input, just by handling it differently and having higher efficiency. We are also looking at undercover. That's the nozzle bodies you're looking at here mounted halfway up on these riser tubes. If we're gonna to go to the expense of fungicide, insecticide, or both in our high yielding corn management program, we spend the same whether we get 5% coverage or 95% coverage. It's the same cost per acre, same active ingredient. So why wouldn't we, knowing where fungal diseases come from, splash up from the soil, why wouldn't we move that expensive fungicide into the canopy. Why would we blow it over the top? Here you can see an aerial versus an undercover, the leaf disease difference. What else are we controlling? Most of the time when we run an expensive fungicide pass for another four to six dollars an acre, we're throwing in a, an insecticide. What are we after? The silk clipping Japanese beetles. And then on soybeans, we're after bean leaf beetles and aphids. What side of the leaf are those aphids on? They're not on the top, they're on the bottom. During our spray period, during the daylight hours of the day, the insects are not on top in the sun, they're underneath in the shade of the canopy. So if we're gonna spend the money on fungicide insecticide on soybeans, we should take the effort and put it on the bottom. Now we're gonna have a little demo over here. We've got some rolling corn boards. We're gonna fire up with Y drop, I believe here, guys. <clears throat> and they're gonna go ahead whenever they're ready. We're gonna do the undercover demo. On your right hand side, we've got top only, and we're gonna let these guys get their nozzles switched over here on the other side. But coverage is the name of the game with fungicide and insecticide. Your fungal diseases splash up out of the soil surface, they make their way up the plant, and if we do severe photosynthesis damage, by eliminating green leaf tissue and replacing it with disease lesions, we're instantly losing yield. There's an economic return threshold like everything, but that's, that's part of where we're at. So we have here some plants from our, fungicide, or from our undercover demo. On this side where we did top down only, you can see really well with this water sensitive paper, we got the tops of the leaves very well. Good coverage. Where are the fungal infection points and where are the insects? On the bottom. We have zero coverage on the bottom and very poor coverage on the ear leaf. These guys are running the demo right now.
They're going to pull the plants, and we're going to run the demo for you here right away. So Reed has the undercover. I already showed you the top down. Eric will hold that up to the camera. Here, we got, not only got coverage really well on the top sides of the leaves, but look at the undersides. Coverage on the underside, good coverage here. On a typical corn plant, there'd be an ear of corn sitting right here. The ear leaf is a major contributor. Look at the coverage and protection that we have on the ear leaf. A significant amount of starch comes from the ear leaf. So going to the extra effort for the same investment of pesticide and fungicide, we're gonna have much better chance of payoff on that expensive investment by putting the pesticide where it goes. We're gonna reset our corn boards and then we're gonna show you a demonstration with the Y-Drop system. So people think Y-Drop looks like a simple system and it is, but you're not looking at design A. Part of making a Y-Drop work is the stem water situation that we talked about. So it's imperative that we place that nitrogen at the base of the plant where we can utilize the stem water effect. You can drizzle nitrogen out with an airplane, you can drizzle it out with a rig like this, and you can swing a garden hose down between the rows pretty cheaply. But is it worth the effort if you're not putting it in the stem water zone? So these guys are gonna go ahead whenever they're ready and they're gonna fire up a demonstration of the Y-Drop system. We've got nitrogen coming out these hoses and we're chaining it together right at the base of the plant and feeding the root system where it exists. So if I'm gonna ask you to go out into high clearance crops, there comes some operator issues with that. That's not an easy thing to do to go into head high corn when you can't see the ground. Reed Oberly is one of our engineers and he came up with a couple of very strong solutions to help the operator make a Y drop pass happen. All right, so there's obviously a lot of really great benefits to go into late season application like Dave's already talked about, but there are definitely some challenges that come with it, especially if you're the one who's actually operating the machine, right? <clears throat> the first one is you're trying to go through this tall crop, you know, you've got wind blowing, you're on a little bit of topography, and it, sometimes it can get really, really hard to see where the center of your corn row is where you're trying to get your high clearance machine to go through, even if you're running with a, with a deer or a, or a patriot as well. Um, you know, so down corn becomes a real thing. You start to really run it over, you're trying to help it, not hurt it here, but you still end up running over just a little bit of it. And there has to be a good solution to that, right? Um, and I'm not gonna say that there aren't great OEM solutions out there. However, the problem with this, they're 100% GPS based. Um, and while that works generally very, very well for planting and that kind of stuff, um, what about, you know, when your planter is drifting? What about if you have a little bit of topography, you're not actually just running right in the center of that row? You know, so GPS systems, the way I like to describe this difference between GPS and tactile, is GPS is, think about you're running to the other end of this building, you can see all, of it, all the obstacles in your way pretty well and that's a good thing. However, you might stumble because you don't know that there's a rock or there might be something that you might trip over down there because you're looking up. Vice versa, on tactile, you're basically you're running to the other end of the building but you're looking straight down at your feet. So you might not, uh, stumble on that rock, but you might run right into that combine because you don't know it's there, right? So there's obviously benefits to both of those. The best way to do it is if you can marry those two systems together. And that's exactly what we've done uh, with the guide system. Essentially, we pull in your OEM GPS position, the positional data there, and then we go ahead and we also get the tactile data from the bottom feelers, and we shift your GPS point based off of what the feeler is telling us uh, as far as your cross track or your position in the row. So if you're three inches off to the left, it's gonna shift your GPS point to tell you that you're three inches off to the left, therefore making your OEM controller, your, your deer auto track that works so well, push you a little bit off to make, make sure that remember, you're not wanting to stay necessarily just on your AB line, you wanna be, <clears throat> you wanna be in the center of the row. Um, very, very similar placement is key when we're talking about wide drop, right? And so we know that we want to have our wide drop bases about 12 to 14 inches off the ground. Make sure that your hoses that are dripping through here, just like what we showed, make sure those are sitting right along the base of the plant, right in that root zone where we want the, where we want the nitrogen to be going to be as useful as it can be. Um, so what we've done there, you know, once again, there are really good OEM systems that um, can help us out. But the problem is those ultrasonic sensors don't work very well when it comes to looking through the foliage of the plant. 
Um, you know, they work very, very well on bare ground. They work really well in short, uh, uh, excuse me, early season crops, but they can't do very well as soon as the canopy is closed. Um, so once again, we've done something very similar to what we did with Guide. Um, we went with a tactile system, and Dave's going to demonstrate it here. Basically, this just mounts to the bottom of the of the vase. And as he lifts up, it goes up, and as he comes down, it comes back down, just like you would expect it to, right? So all we've done here is we've unplugged the ultrasonic sensors, and we've plugged our system in instead, and it doesn't know the difference. So you still have your BoomTrack Pro, you still have your NORAC UC5 or UC7, and they work just as well as they ever have, but actually they're going to work better now because they have better positional data. So what we're doing here is we're looking for better ROI on what we're doing to make it a little bit easier for you to do it, as well as reducing your stress, reducing your crop damage, um, and just maximizing the ROI on what you're doing here. So if you want to take a look at anything, feel free. We're going to talk a little bit about bullet here. Uh, and for the 360 bullet, it's all about maximum fracture and uh, really allowing the roots to go where they want to go. Uh, with the bullet, you achieve maximum fracture because we've got 14 inch wide bullets. Uh, shank to shank, 24 inch shanks. It's really exploding the profile and making it all, leveling the whole, the whole field so that it, it offer, gives you a, uh, a good planting seed bed uh, where the seed can go wherever it wants. And it's, it's allowing the roots to, to find the nutrients and, and seek out the nutrients a little bit easier. Um, it also helps with drainage. Um, with, the, with the flat open uh, field base, the, the water drains away a lot better than with the uh, OEMs where it can pool up because of the, the compact ridges. Uh, so the, the bullet's main advantage is fracturing the, uh, the profile of the soil as, as much as possible. Uh, we've seen up to six bushels per acre imp improved yield by using the bullet over the OEM, the seven inch OEM uh, points. A uh, couple studies that we've done. Uh, eliminating the density changes really helps um, with, with seed growth and, and um, you can see here in the, the picture, uh, it's a very visual aerial uh, view of, of what the OEM point looks like versus the 360 uh, bullet. Um, on the right is a bullet and it's a, it's a very much a um, more uniform base. Uh, whereas the OEM point, you can see all the ridges and where the water tends to, uh, to pool up and um, stick around longer than, than what it does with the bullet. Uh, we offer three different styles and depending on your, your soil type, uh, the machine that you've got, um, the, the three different styles are the, the high wear, which is uh, typically for you know, no rock environments, um, sandy, uh, more, more wear type uh, applications. We have the heavy duty, which is a fabricated bullet. Um, goes on the Landall and the inch and a half DMI shanks. Um, <coughs> it's, a, it's a heavy duty, so it, it takes impact a little bit better than what the, the high wear does. And then with the third uh, version we offer is, is our uh, 360 bullet HD plus. Um, again, it's, it's got the, the same casting material as our high wear, but it's got hardened caps that go on the, the nose and the wings. Uh, allowing it to take impacts uh, better than what um, the, the high wear bullet does. Uh, again, um, the, uh, the different models that we go on, see a chart here um, of all the different models that go on. Depending on, on the ripper that you've got, it helps you decide which, which bullet you need. A um, couple pictures of what wear looks like. Uh, we've, got, we've got all the, the bullets that rode on our, our uh, nine shank um, 875 ripper. Uh, we've got the bullet HD. Uh, you can see the 311 acres per shank. It's about 2,800 acres on that nine shank bar. Um, you can see where it, it's worn uh, pretty well. 360 bullet HD plus is the, uh, the cast with the, the hard caps uh, on, on the casting. And then you have the, the HW, which is just the cast machine, uh, the, the cast bullet. Um, showing the, the different wear for uh, all three of the different versions we've got. So that's a little bit about the bullet. Um, helps improve your bushels per acre by about six over the OEM shanks and uh, offer it for a variety of different rippers. Um, uh, talk to your dealer about, what, uh, about your ripper and uh, see what we can do for you. 
So this, this portion of the night is, is focused primarily on header loss and, and some of the things we can do to mitigate that. So what we first want to start with is, does anybody know how many kernels in a square foot on the ground it takes to make a bushel? So what we've seen, um, what most university studies use is about two kernels per square foot. So that, that varies a little bit uh, depending on kernel size, moisture, different things like that. But if you look at the ground, if you're checking loss out the back of the combine or out the head, and you see two kernels per square foot, that's going to be equal about a bushel. So you can have more or less than that, but, but that's, that's generally the rule of thumb. So if we know that two kernels in a bushel, two kernels in a square foot makes a bushel, the question is how much, how many of those kernels can we save with yield savers? So what we did this fall is we went and chased a bunch of combines. Uh, we took a bunch of measurements of what the loss with the OEM chain versus the loss with yield saver was. And this is a good example of what we found. This is actually out of our, our head at home. It's a case 4408. On the yield saver side, we saw about 21 kernels. On the OEM side, we saw about 106 kernels. So that's a 50 square foot area. What that figures to is about 81% savings. So that corn was at 19% moisture. We know as we get drier, that's gonna increase. Uh, and as that corn gets a little bit wetter, that number could decrease a little bit or stay the same, but the, the relativity between those two is, is going gonna, is gonna to be the same. So we wanted to, to talk a little bit about ROI just from the standpoint. Uh, we know we can save the kernels, but in the end, what you guys care about is dollars. So what we really had to look at is how many, how many kernels do we have to save or how many bushels do we have to save in order for yield saver to pay for itself. So. In this example, we've got a 608C, it's a John Deere head, eight rows, farmer farming about 1,200 acres of corn. That's gonna be about 150 acres a row on yield saver. So that's typically what we say for the lifespan. So what we figure is we figure two bushel loss. So what we've checked in the last few years is we've seen anywhere from a two to five bushel loss out of the head on combines. So if we figure 80% savings at a two bushel loss, that gives us 1.6 bushels that we're, we're saving. So at a 390 corn price, I checked the price this morning, it was 389 at home. Uh, we figure 390 corn price, that gives us about $6.24 an acre savings. So what we're clearing, our net profit per year is about $2,700. So that's an eight row corn head, $600 a row. What we figure for year two is we're replacing those brushes, we're keeping the chains on. So we're at about a $5,200, $5,300 savings for year two. So you figure in year one, you spend $600 a row. Year two, you're replacing the brushes. Year three, you're replacing the brushes. In a three year time span, your net profit <coughs> is $13,264. So, We've got these ROI calculators online. I encourage you guys to go out, check them out, uh, punch in your own numbers. If you got a 12 row head, you're farming 1,500 acres of corn, see what it's going to take for those yield savers to pay themselves back. Uh, with that, we'll have Phil fire up the combine and we'll run a little demonstration for you. side of the head over here would be your OEM chain, the right side over here is yield saver. So after we get done just emptying these tubes out, we'll raise the head, sweep up the tarp, and we'll do a comparison. Should be good enough. 
you can see here the difference. Um, in Kurt's left hand would be the yield saver, and then his right hand would be the, the OEM chain. So uh, that's just a, a demonstration we like to do, kind of show, we obviously realize this is kind of an extreme situation, but uh, it shows the benefit of yield saver and uh, does a really nice, good, really nice job of, of demonstrating how these actually works. Look at what's going on in our industry today. We're pushing the envelope with things in terms of our seed genetics. We're pushing population. We're getting in a position where we have genetics that the rind on that corn plant, that stalk, is tougher. The pith is not decaying as fast in this, in, throughout the season. So what do we do? We take the steps to try to manage that. We'll go through and run a tillage piece uh, pass. Uh, we're putting stock chopping equipment on ahead. Uh, we're looking at ways to try to manage that residue better. What if you could make a pass with your combine that would accomplish that very step that you're after and also give you some other advantage? And that's where 360 chain roll comes into play. With regard to 360 chain roll, what you're looking at are the remnants that are left over here. I'll show you some differences. Behind me, we had a pass of through the corn stalks with the combine. On your right, you're going to see both yield saver and 360 chain roll. And on your left, you're going to see the standard gathering chain or OEM gathering chain along with the standard stock rolls. That particular piece of stubble is a result of a standard gathering or excuse me, a standard stock roll. You look at what's happening with chain roll, we've, we've gone through, we splintered that stubble. That's that piece that's left there. In addition, we're looking at pieces of residue that are left like this in the OEM versus smaller pieces. If we can get it down to, say, a six, seven, eight inch piece of stock, we're crimping that as we go through. We're opening this material up for it to have air and water enter and we're able to get that microbial activity to begin breaking down. Reality is we know that we've got three things going on for us. We have a lot more plant matter with which to work with, but within that plant matter we have nutrients. We've got N, P, and K and magnesium and so on, calcium that are tied up inside of this plant material that if we can get it to be released and beneficial to our growing crop, all the better for us and the sooner the better. But we also need to be able to manage the amount of material that we have out there. And from that standpoint, we also need to look at how we can come back in next spring so we're preparing for our seed bed. So if we can make that pass, we can put 360 chain roll on your corn head and run through and be able to manage your stubble in a positive way as well as break up some of the, uh, the, the residue, break it down. Take a look at what we're looking at here. Uh, this happens to be beans planted. On the left, you see typical residue that comes in from a lot of our standard uh, stock rolls. On your right, you see how the row cleaner has pushed some of that out of the way and allowed for a more clear pass with, with, with regard to where we're putting that seed in the ground. Chain roll is about sizing in a way that we have the ability with our row cleaner to kick that that residue out of the way. It's also sized in a way that when we are receiving you know, strong winds or we have water that's going to move residue from it, that these pieces have more likelihood to stay put. Contrast that to the scenario where we try to chop that and we get small confetti pieces. We got an opening on each end that allows air and water to get in, but we have a piece that's very susceptible to moving. And then the next step is that same little piece if it stays around we come back in at planting time we may not be able to kick it out of the way and clear a path we also may see it then get pushed down into the seed trench get hair pinning we minimize our ability for that plant to develop we, we affect germination we affect we may delay germination or, or not let germination take place at all so I mentioned talking about the, the nitrogen and the P and the K that are tied up inside of that. If we look at a typical 200 bushel type uh, yield, what are we leaving? After we pull the grain off, we're seeing in the neighborhood of 90 pounds of nitrogen per acre left in the stover. We're seeing 30 plus pounds of our, our P left in the field. 
and about 220 pounds of, of our potassium left in the field. From that standpoint, can we get that to release sooner by opening it up and letting microbial activity, that air and water get in, but microbial activity begin to break it down and make it available for us. We always talk about ROI. What's really the value of chain roll? And we look at it and think about what our gain is if we can improve our seed emergence and we can begin to uh, capitalize on plants that are, that are healthy and happy in there. Typically what I'd look at is about a two bushel difference. We we'll probably see a couple of extra plants that are gonna emerge as a result and probably two bushel advantage over your chopping roll, that one that's gonna make confetti pieces out of it. And if you can do the math on that, we can all come up with whatever we want on it uh, from a standpoint of how many acres we're gonna do. Uh, let's say we do 1,500 acres. If we can get two bushels out of that, that's 3,000. Put uh, 350 on that, somebody do the math for me real quick. What's that come out to be? 35 times three, 3.5 times 3,000 is gonna give us what, 10, 10 11,000 dollars type scenario? To put chain roll on a head, let's take an eight row head for example. It's about, a, it's just under $1,100 to put chain roll on per row. So we're looking at 1090. If we ran 1,500 acres with our eight row head, we're gonna you know, generate about 10.5 more in our revenue. The cost to upgrade that 1,090 per row is just, just over $8,700. Your ROI in year one in that scenario is gonna get you about 20% return there. That's just in the first year. If we don't believe in that two bushels and we knock that back, it might take more than one year to get to our final level. But the clear picture I would tell you is that we're back here and we're planting into some cleaner situations where we have the ability for our, our stock material to break down. One other key I wanna mention here, you, you listen possibly to what they were talking about on the yield saver side. You see red flags on your right there identifying kernels that were dropped behind the yield savers. About 45 kernels were dropped in that scenario. Over here, we were looking at 220 plus kernels that were dropped in the standard gathering chain. The value of 360 chain roll and 360 yield saver to your operation, saving kernels and then getting a chance to get the nutrients out of those stocks and get that stock breakdown to take place. Any questions anybody can ask? Appreciate everybody. So our little six row planner here, we're demonstrating how you would put nitrogen as starter on. You know, we talk a lot about this planter pass. You and I know that every every pass that, that planter is going to make, if we can add nitrogen or starter to it, makes quite a difference to us. So we're going to be demonstrating our little nitrogen applicators here called Bandit. And Bandit simply comes in and we put nitrogen three inches on each side of the seed. And so it's a three by three quarter. We're only going about three quarters of an inch deep because we're using nature. I talk about how much pressure does it take if we're going to put these discs in deeper than the seed. So we know that moisture, so if it starts to rain here, we're going to start to migrate that nitrogen down. Your crown, it's going to start to put out the crown plants and it's going to grow right through that nitrogen hot zone. And so we're excited about being able to use moisture to migrate that nitrogen down. So we're going to be three inches on each side of the seed. And so Bandit runs, it's got a hose tube guide here that you can see here. That's actually running right into the, you know, the slot that the disc on each side are making. So the reason we like banding so much, we know that if we can band nitrogen, it's going to be 2x over what you say a broadcast would be. And the reason that we think it's 2x the value is because of these guys. And these guys are out there in your field and there's a lot of these guys. And they're good guys. The microbials are the guys that we like. We talk about them all the time. They give you what? Free nitrogen. But early in the season, if you're broadcasting in 28% across there, they're gonna be feeding on it. And all of a sudden we got a young corn plant here and it's starting, if we got all these guys down here eating the nitrogen, all of a sudden we're going to start to yellow that plant out. So by coming in and banding a concentration, 
we can lower the amount of what your broadcast would be and still get a lot of bang for the buck. Also on this planner, we got a new system called Dash. And Dash is where you come in, Andy, go ahead and fire it up. You'll see it here and it'll be pulsating. And so as you see it pulsate, what we're doing is we're coming in every time a seed comes out of the seed tube, we have the technology where we can lay a dash of starter right where the seed is. So the minute your radical starts to grow out, we're gonna go right into this concentration band of starter. So it's all about saying if we use starter, can we use less dollars per acre but get more yield, more bang for the buck. So we'd have, instead of coming in, let's say this seed is six inches apart, we could come in and put half or three inch dash on, or we could come in and put a two inch dash in there. And so it's the concentration beside it where your root grows into it that starts to get really positive. So we know that a, it, all the way from headland to headland is $28 an acre on a starter program. The minute you and I cut it in half, now we're down to $14 an acre. If we can cut it by two thirds, we're down to $9 an acre. And so it's all about saying, can we raise more corn with less dollars by having the concentration here the minute that radical first roots out, grow right into that. You notice that we have a gator sitting here on the track. We call it Sprint. You can see it running up here on the, on the computer. Let's talk about it a little bit. So we come in and we say, in our operation, we're gonna have the planter put on that first pass of nitrogen and we're looking for 85 pounds of N. So I'm gonna be using 25 gallon to the acre of 28%. I'm gonna use six gallon to the acre of thiosol. So in other words, we like to put sulfur on every time we put in. And so now we're looking at 31 gallon. And so you think about the volume that you carry in a tank and you can see why we're bringing a sprint operation in. So Noel, why don't we follow this planter? Let's thread her down, we'll watch Bandit first. So you're gonna see Bandit here running. It's gonna run about three quarters of an inch in the ground. We'll just run him slow. And we'll bring up the sprint. The sprint will come up. It's gonna go right into the funnel you see on the TV screen. He's got a two inch pump. That gator's carrying 300 gallon of fertilizer. And so he's gonna engage. He's gonna click it on. If you look up on the left tank up there, you're gonna see nitrogen, in this case water, coming into that tank. And so he has an air system as he shuts off here. He's got the capability of blowing it. You can shut your motor off there, Don. So he's got the ability to come in. It takes about three minutes for us to move 300 gallon into the planter on the move. It comes down to being 30% more efficient. What we found in our 60 foot planters is we get an extra 100 acres a day. So it's all about saying, how do you and I stay more efficient as we talk about bringing nitrogen? I'm a huge fan of banded nitrogen, but I feel like we don't want to stop our planters more by carrying it, so we're bringing the sprint to move it. You notice we're pumping up there in the front of the tractor in two tanks on each side that we designed. They're extremely narrow, and they're moved to the back of the axle. And so we're able to carry 700 gallon on the tractor. We moved a lot of the weight off the front axle, so it's got good visibility on each side. We do a lot of road work of our planter tractors. It's all about safety. We like being able to carry 700 gallon, but not putting ourselves at risk. So we'll talk more about it on the stage here in a minute or two, but that's kind of what we're showing. You can see the chains that we have with the bandit kits, and you can see how they're moving the soil and leveling it off behind the closing wheels. So there's several different styles of closing on this planter, and we're just demonstrating all those different things. So feel free to look around all the sites should be running. Just go help yourself to any of the demos and take a look at what we're doing.